Alrighty, guys. Um, everyone find a seat. Um, so listen, I am really thrilled to be talking to my two favorite professors on my very favorite subject, which is uh, marketplaces. And I thought we'd start out and talk a little bit about the, um, how marketplaces can have a very big impact on the world and on society, not just on how it can disrupt industries. It's a good place to kind of start, and then we'll talk a little bit more about um, how you build them. So there's one school of thought that I subscribe to that I know is not necessarily a standard convention at this point, which is that um, distributed networks or marketplaces are going to actually displace um, uh, corporations and redefine work and what it means to be a worker going forward. That historically having a big balance sheet with assets like cars and hotel rooms um, and lots of employees was a uh, position of strength. And I think now those balance sheet assets are no longer assets or liabilities. And the question I have for you guys is, how do you view kind of the world going forward and how do um, distributed networks have a role? I think some people are asking the question, are we moving from the industrial age to kind of a network age? And do you guys buy that? Do you believe that? You know, you're going to have to think about services versus manufacturing. Bechtel is going to want to own lots of earth-moving machinery uh, going forward. But Bechtel's employees may not be as tied to Bechtel as they used to be because the, the Bechtel can no longer easily make a, a barrier that stops you from knowing who, do, who does what. Uh, LinkedIn lets them tunnel under that barrier and let, the, and let you know that if you work for Bechtel, you could work for someone else as well. So I think even, even big manufacturing companies are going to be affected by, by networks. So how do you see service businesses, right? I mean, the service economy is huge. Is Uber and Airbnb anomalous, that there's distributed networks that leverage the power of people and their personal assets going to change industries? Or do you think that this is the beginning of a, a large wave of these kind of companies? So if we think, I tend to think of this as a continuum. So the, in the industrial era, so let's say for services, not manufacturing. So you have vertically integrated companies that employ people. And now Uber, Airbnb, and many others that are probably represented here propose a new model in which companies don't employ the workers and there's a lot more flexibility, workers have a lot more control and so on. So that's the other extreme. So it's very tempting probably to think that it's gonna be a big shift towards the latter, so in which we're gonna say, we're gonna see a lot of independent workers just you know, basically connecting directly with customers. But I think the reality is in a lot of sectors, the shift is not gonna be 100%. So there's probably gonna be a continuum and depending on the sector, in some sectors we can probably go very far along this continuum towards independent workers. In other sectors, probably doesn't make a lot of sense. And I mean, the, and then I think the question will be for both entrepreneurs and I guess for especially for investors, how do we know when it makes more sense to move towards the purely distributed network versus to stay closer to the traditional controlled employee model? And you know, there are a couple. There are some factors that you and I have talked about a few times. So you know. If you think about it, so what is the advantage of a distributed network? Well, it can cater to a larger, say, a larger diversity of consumer customer preferences. On the other hand, if you need, say, jobs or services where, so which require participation of multiple workers or coordination, it probably means you need more control by the firm. And there are a bunch of other factors probably that come into play. So the question that brings up for me, so let's assume for a moment that distributed networks actually displace a lot of industries, right? But the definition of what means to be a worker, the definition of what a company is, and the definition of work itself really changes. I'll give you an example, right? We've lived historically in a world where you had one employer, had one employee, you had one job at a time, and that job was an ongoing work, right? And we're moving, it feels like potentially, to a world where one person can work for multiple companies at a time, and that work could be kind of project work or gig work. I mean, is that, is that going to happen? Do you think that's going to be pervasive? And if so, like, what impact does it have for entrepreneurs here and for society? A lot of companies, are go a lot of marketplaces, a lot of businesses are still going to want reliable workers in the same place for a long time. You're going to want to, you, there's some value in seeing the same doctor every time you go to the hospital, not seeing a different one. So medicine is certainly going to have gig work, but there's also going to be salaried employees and, and medical partnerships that, that last for a long time. So I, I would agree. I mean, I, st I, I still, it, it comes back to the same idea of a continuum. There's certain industries for which you're not going to see a big shift towards completely contract-based, flexible workers. But there's, they're probably, I don't know, they're probably going to be more than we can imagine today. So I think that the his if you look at 
across the last 10 years with the history, the evolution of marketplaces, they were always at every point in time, we would look at certain products or services and we'd say, that's impossible. This will never go to a marketplace. Let's say cars. You're in a good position to know this. Presumably when you started eBay Motors, people looked yeah. at you and say, who's going to want to buy cars online? It makes no sense. It's impossible to sell this on a marketplace. Well, sure enough, it is possible. You can also buy and sell uh, houses online. And presumably we'll go you know, up the ladder and we'll move into services which can be, uh, which can be contracted on marketplaces, services that we would, think, we would probably think are impossible to do so today. I probably think medicine is probably going to stay at so the top, you know, surgery or something like that will probably be beyond the reach, but we'll probably get, you know, we'll probably get fairly close. I mean, that, I think that's the beauty yeah. of it. Well, there's already a gig economy in emergency rooms. Right? There we so go. You, when you go into a hospital to an emergency room, often it's surgical residents moonlighting in the emergency room. You know, that's right. the kind of thing that, that you can do. You don't have a relationship with the emergency room doctors, but with some doctors, you, you want right. them to know your history. Yeah. I think the thing is for anyone who's looking to kind of build a marketplace is that trust um, is kind of the center of a marketplace, and we'll talk in a little bit how you, you um, broker trust. Right. But what's happened is over the past you know, 10 years or so, people are much more comfortable using technology. And where the marketplace 10 years ago had to kind of do heroics to kind of engender the kind of trust necessary to get a transaction to happen, I think people are just so comfortable and familiar with tech that they're, they're just kind of ascribing kind of um, a lot of trust to it. So I don't think it's unreasonable to assume that intimates, high ASP, complex transactions right. will all move online, where 10 years ago it was almost impossible to do. I think today you could do that, right? right? I think so I, I completely agree. Again, I think it's very hard. Like sometimes, it's just very hard for us to project five years in the future because we don't have the maybe the proper marketplace institutions in place. Okay. But we'll slowly get there. So traditionally, with manufactured goods, with high ASP, high average sale price goods, right, like cars or houses, there was the issues. I don't know if the good is going to get there. I don't trust the seller. Well, we've solved that, right? Now with services. I mean, what's the, what's the biggest problem? It's reliability, being able to contact the same person, reputation, credible reputation, mm -hmm. which, you know, it's not, not easy to do. But I'm sure some, you know, clever marketplaces will, come, will come, come up and we'll figure out a way to write contracts or to, you know, to design mechanisms that essentially produce the trust that, that we need in order to, uh, to get to these, you know, more complex services and have them transacted on marketplaces as opposed to on the traditional employee model. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about how to build a marketplace in this era, right? And I'm not sure how many people here are looking to build them or to invest in them, but it feels like there's been this natural evolution, and I'm trying to figure out what the next step is, right? So historically, if you look back at kind of the birth of the Internet, marketplaces were horizontal, uh, like you think of eBay or Alibaba, lots and lots of categories. They were national in scope. They tended to kind of cover entire countries at a time. Um, and they were... Um, they were um, you know, national, for, and they were product-based for the most right. part, right? So you're buying and selling products. Today in the mobile era, right, not kind of the desktop, laptop world, you're seeing marketplaces that are hyper-local, Uber, Airbnb. You're seeing them service-based, and you're seeing them very vertically oriented. Is that something that in the mobile era you need to focus on, or do you think there's a possibility to have something that feels more horizontal, that feels more product-oriented, that feels more national? I could well imagine... Airbnb going more horizontal and not only getting you a room but a restaurant reservation and uh, maybe an airline ticket once they know about your travel plans. So I don't think there's a natural evolution from horizontal to vertical. I think that, that each market has its own demands and you have to think of, of how to supply, how to make the market think first, how to get, how to get lots of buyers and sellers together. And sometimes that, that involves starting vertically, but, but I could imagine that Airbnb will, will not be satisfied to just do the housing. Yeah, what do you think? Uh, so my sense is not going to be, uh, this is, I think it's a very interesting question. So for anyone that's trying to build marketplaces, it's going to become increasingly important to figure out whether you want to be vertical, i.e. to completely specialize and own a vertical, let's say, I don't know, cars or rooms or... Uh, I don't know, groceries or something like that, or say I'm actually going to expand and try to cover multiple verticals at the time. I think being, so the technology, so mobile, actually enables you to, to really choose between, between all of those. So you can be either high, very specialized or you can be very general. So then the only question, so the question becomes, well, how do you know which one's better? Well, it has to do with the underlying economics of the, of the relevant verticals and how they interact with each other. 
So presumably, just like we traditionally in economics, we would say conglomerates only make sense in sectors and where the, you can ex extract some synergies by being in multiple sectors. Presumably, if you're, if you're trying to be a horizontal marketplace, it would only make sense to do so if there are some synergies that you can produce either for buyers or for sellers by covering multiple verticals. So what might those synergies be? Well, if it's someone, maybe someone going to Airbnb, I don't know, maybe they're also in the market for, I'm making this up right now, but renting a car or getting a date or wh whoever knows. I'm, or local activities. Exactly, or local activities, exactly. Or okay. sightseeing, for example. So mm -hmm. there, there's, there's probably, there are probably marketplaces now that connect you with local guides. Well, Airbnb could do that, right? I mean, that's, they would be in a good position. So that would be an example. I mean, it would have to make sense in terms of synergies. Yeah. The other, I think the other factor that's very interesting here that could potentially create synergy is the notion of long tail versus short tail um, verticals. So there are some verticals which honestly, and I'm sure you've seen a ton of these, it just doesn't make sense to have a marketplace. I mean, I'm sure you've seen a lot of ridiculous marketplaces, Uber for, I'm not gonna give examples. Don't say it, a, someone here may be actually building one. Do not so, say okay, it. So I'll say, I'll say, say one, it. I'll say one which is my favorite funny <laughs> example is AirPNP. Raise your hand if you've heard of AirPNP. You don't know what AirPNP is? Well, look it up. Uh, it, it's it, awesome. It, it's Airbnb for restrooms. So exactly. We'll leave it at that. So people basically have thought about every possible vertical and put a marketplace there. Well, for some of these verticals, I think just having one marketplace just for that is probably not enough. Yeah. But now if you think about it, these are, these are long tail verticals. How about having a marketplace that covers all of these, like a horizontal that kind of aggregates the long tail? Yeah. And yeah, I mean, my view for what it's worth, and I don't, I, I, I completely agree that there isn't a reason that you don't have a horizontal marketplace in this mobile era. My view is that the world is very noisy and it's very complicated and it's harder to build a company today right. than it was five or ten years ago. And the way to kind of enter is to drive a wedge into an industry. And the sharper the point of the wedge, the easier it is to kind of open up the industry. Yeah. And that your vertical is, is a proxy for the complexity of entering a market today, as opposed to kind of you can only build a vertical right. business. So I'm actually excited to see in a mobile era the first horizontal marketplace. Because in many ways, horizontal marketplaces can be so much bigger than vertical marketplaces. Yeah. They're just harder to start there. So much harder. I, I like your analogy of the wedge. Um, <clears throat> the, the first task of the marketplace is to become thick. So supposing you wanted to compete with eBay, because now that Cuba is opening up, there might be a market for Cuban cigars. Uh, you might be better off starting a, a cigar marketplace rather than trying to get a category on eBay yeah, that you would exactly. dominate. And to be clear, I mean, if you think of eBay, even Amazon, those businesses, they all had a wedge as well, right? eBay's wedge was collectible items, which were not just inefficient, they were ineffective. Amazon going to books where no one had actually created selection that was universal and comprehensive. So even the horizontal marketplaces we know today that are actually quite old also had a wedge. I just think the point, the, the kind of the, the sharpness of that point has to be sharper today or kind of more refined than it was 10 years ago. And so I think you're going to see some horizontal marketplaces. In local, for me, my view is that the reason local took off first is your phone unlocks real time in real place right here, right now. Yeah. And so those ideas were obvious, but there isn't a reason that your phone can't do other things. I, I think of a phone as enabling me, an individual, to be a node of a network, right? It lets me be you know, part of this broad network, and that's more powerful than just time and place. So I'm excited to see a lot of a new generation of companies that, that kind of build big, broad companies. Uh, so just two, two, two points on this. So I, I, I completely agree. I think it's, today is probably impossible. Like, no one would probably fund you if you say, I'm going to go and compete with eBay. So there's, I mean, I think part of the logic yeah. of, or at least not directly, right? Not, sure. not in the first year. So I think part of the logic of specializing vertically is like there's economies of specialization. And yeah. you know, a lot of the verticals have been taken. You just need to find something and go deep enough before you actually can think about going yeah. horizontally. And one thing I like, and it, this applies for marketplaces, um, the bigger you want to be, the smaller you have to start. I mean, I, I really agree. fundamentally nice. believe that. And I think that's more true today and probably become more true going forward than has been. So. But there, there are also going to be technological changes that determine what kind of markets you can make. It makes sense that there was no eBay before the internet and that right. eBay was founded along with the internet, but Uber needed the smartphone, it needed Absolutely. your location, no question, it needed yeah. mobility.
Absolutely, I think it's true. Well, let's switch gears to a topic that I don't know if it'll be controversial, but I think it might be, which is in the past two, three years, the Uber for X or the on-demand business, these office-intensive marketplaces have been incredibly popular, right? I, I don't know, lots of people in this room may have started one, some people here may have funded one or maybe worked for one, but it really has been this large wave, this kind of almost tsunami of kind of startup activity that's happened. And I think that all of them felt like there was no bad idea. And I feel like we're, we're turning the corner hard this year, and I believe the media is going to kind of amplify the message that they're all bad ideas, that none of them are going to work, that the reality of unit economics, the reality of venture capital drying up so you can't subsidize consumer pricing is going to hit hard. And I guess the question I have is that where do you think this lands? Like, is there a world for ops intensive marketplaces? You know, businesses that you have to move product and people from place to place? And if so, is Silicon Valley the place to build those? Or is that kind of not a Silicon Valley thing because it's not pure software? Well, you know, the, the marketplace that I've been involved in that's the most operation intensive is kidney exchange. We, we help hospitals that do kidney transplants uh, organize the chains of transplants that can be done uh, nowadays. Uh, so the, the operations are done in the hospitals, but kidneys are shipped from hospital to hospital. And, and so the marketplace is almost like a labor market. It's matching patients and hospitals, patients and donors. Uh, it's operational intensive. The, the operations get conducted at transplant centers, but the marketplace is the network. Literally operations. Yes, I was literally actually kind operations. of thinking, you know, not literally yeah. operations. So what do you think? Are we going to have this? Because I think that debate will be one of the central debates this year in kind of the marketplace world is, should we be building those? Are they profitable businesses? And, and why Silicon Valley in the middle of ops intensive businesses where my view is you have to count pennies and seconds and we're really bad at counting seconds. You know, physical world seconds, we're very good at uh, counting milliseconds on computers, but that's a very different world. Yeah. Is that our world? Should we be doing this? So you and I have had this conversation. I mean, my view is that the more we go into ops, and so capital intensive, ops intensive, the further you are from a pure marketplace. I mean, if you step back for a second, the, the main reason you want to be a marketplace is precisely because I don't want to own things and I don't want to really build things. The beauty of a marketplace, when it's pure, at its purest form, is that I just enable transactions between other people and I don't have to own stuff or I don't have to move stuff yeah. around. Now, the reality is, of course, those pure marketplaces, they're very few and far between. They tend to be horizontal and kind of the big ideas there have been taken. So you have to work a little harder. You have to do, I think the reality is today is you have to, find, to work a little harder, get into a little bit ops, of ops in order to, you know, to make it to be different than the others. But I think that that's, that's where the challenge lies. I mean, you're kind of losing the essence and the advantages of a marketplace by getting into operations, and that's why the unit economics are not great. Also, the other part is the more you get into ops intensive, the less likely you are that the network effects that we love about marketplaces, the less likely you are that those network effects are very big, right? It te typically tends to be network effects that are very local, and I guess it's not as attractive to invest in as opposed to, say, marketplaces that span countries or, yeah. or continents. Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, listen, as an investor and a guy who's built marketplaces, there's this notion that local marketplaces are worse because you can split the market if someone figures out how to kind of drive a playbook and get liquidity in mar one market, that theoretically someone else could do the same thing in other markets and split the country or split the world. And while that is very real theoretically, I find practically it never happens. Yeah. Figuring out how to get the playbook, how to get a marketplace to work and get liquidity in one area is so freaking hard that replicating it is very easy. And so the first person to kind of figure it out, this kind of race of liquidity, if you can right. figure it out first, odds are you can stamp it across the country and around the world before someone else figures it out. The only exception I've ever seen, which makes for a really interesting you know, industry, is Uber and Lyft. I mean, if you think about it, in many ways, Lyft figured it out first. They came up with a business model that evolved was UberX. And they came up with it first, and Uber has done just an amazing job recognizing the power of that playbook, replicating that playbook, yeah. and moving fast. But historically, it's very hard to find any industry or any business work where figuring it out isn't 95% of the work, and replicating is just small. How about eBay and then in China, Alibaba? Alibaba. That is true, um, but that was different because the market actually it turned out to be true in Japan also. Yeah. Where, where Yahoo, I guess, is. Yeah, where, where essentially the moats, and this brings up a good topic, there's a lot of cultural moats, there are a lot of regulatory moats, and there are a lot of other moats that 
we don't talk about in polite society where, you know, where it's very hard to build because it is not open free markets, that markets actually are controlled by things that aren't just customers. And I think coming up with a playbook is not stronger, it's not strong enough to overcome a lot of those moats. I think those moats are real. Like right now, if you're building a company now and you want to go to China, it's hard. It yeah. is really freaking hard. It doesn't even matter if you understand your business. I think understanding China in many ways matters more than understanding your own business. So can I add one, so one point to your, so to sort of the puzzle why even though they seem on the surface less attractive, it's actually really hard. So if someone builds a local marketplace in San Francisco, you don't, I mean, I guess what you're saying is you don't really see someone else becoming dominant in Boston because That's it's right. actually typically very hard. I think it has to do, so then it's no longer so much the network effects that matter. It's basically learning effects and scale, right? So in the case of Uber, Uber and Lyft, it's interesting. It's not so much, the business model is not complicated. I mean, the idea of connecting drivers with you know, users is not very complicated. But then there is a very, it's a, there's a huge scale effect driven by data. You know, if I get a lot of data, so if I figure out how to match, you know, properly uh, drivers, so at peak time, drivers and users in San Francisco, actually that does carry over. Like the, the experience that I have, you know, how, how I use the data. So that's, that's a source of competitive advantage that you can have with the, with the very yeah. deeply local ones. And I'll add one more thing that may be helpful for entrepreneurs. So in marketplaces, getting to liquidity first is pretty much everything, but I'd say the only thing that I, I believe matters almost as much is speed, and we don't, I don't think we talk enough about it. I mean, there's a lot of talk about how you build an MVP. I'd actually even argue building and coding your first product, your MVP, maybe is already too slow. The companies that are winning now, and I think the companies you're gonna see that win in the next five years, they're gonna be defined by how fast they go. I mean, not to the point they move historically fast, so fast it's actually hard to copy them. I'd like to see, and I, th I think if you play this out to its logical conclusion, I'd like to see a business that almost publishes its business, open sources its business model, okay. and says, I'm gonna move so fast, I dare someone to kind of build this faster, better than I can build it. And I think if you can't build a company today with that confidence of speed to publish your, your open source your business model, you probably aren't moving fast enough, is my, my general view. Can I ask you a question? So we're writing an article together. I think we said the exact opposite thing in the article. No, 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 no. Can we, can we recon you'll see the article in a month, but I not, think we Not exactly, but I get Let's it. Let's reconcile. So, so recon listen, race to liquidity, getting the first, if you're a marketplace, getting to liquidity first is pretty much all you need to do. My point is for all entrepreneurs generally, speed will matter as much as anything else. And even for marketplace, the speed to get to liquidity matters. I just think we've, we haven't talked enough about the competence of going fast um, right. in the Silicon Valley. And, and what was fast was probably 50 miles per hour fast. I'm talking about 100 mile per hour fast. So can I just, just, uh, just to clarify yeah. this point, I think what, what, what we discussed and what we end up saying in the article is that there, there was this notion that appeared since the early days of the internet that with network businesses, you have to get big very fast. And I think there's a nuance oh, no, no. there. There's I think liquidity th versus size. So I think yeah. that's, the one, that's the point we want to clarify. Well, actually, you think of network businesses, for example. Uh, if you go even social networks, not just kind of uh, marketplaces. So Facebook was not the first social right. network. It was the third. Um, Friendster and MySpace actually had size, but they didn't have liquidity, right? They didn't have great repeat rate. And so I think th the point we were talking about is that bigness is not synonymous for liquidity in a marketplace. Right. It's just not. You can buy size, but that's not the same as actually being liquid and being efficient, right? Fair and enough. So, that's, so yeah. they're separate points. But, but, fair enough. but there are local and global network effects. Uber might be possible to enter against, and you could start in Redwood City and right. have a, that's right. a better Uber. Uh, or another marketplace that's thick. You know, if, if, if I think of possible threats to Uber, I think about Google Maps. You know, could Google enter on Uber using all the Google Maps users and, and just adding a button? Well, I'm not sure I would invest in that, but I hear you. <laughs> all right, so let's do this. If folks are interested in asking questions, if not, we, we've got a lot of other fun stuff to talk about at marketplaces and how to build them. But if you guys are interested in asking some questions, come on up and ask some questions, and we'd be thrilled to kind of answer them. You, you talked about speed and kind of uh, gave a hint towards how fast Uber's moving compared to Lyft, but how, how do you measure speed and the cost of that? Because like there's been a large cost and the current financial market has allowed Uber to 
how, like use that those those funds they needed, but how do you balance like kind of like what you said liquidity and efficiency with speed? Well, listen, money can buy you many things. Um, some are good, some are bad. I'm actually writing an article on this right now. So, but, but here's the thing is, buying speed is not the same as buying liquidity, is not the same as buying growth, is not the same as buying you know, other uh, variations of size. And I actually think some things are bad. So my personal belief is that we're exiting the era where you could use money to kind of buy some speed. For example, if you don't know if you have product market fit with your customer and you're not sure what the pricing is, the easiest thing to do is subsidize it. So if you've got a balance sheet filled with millions of dollars, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars, you don't need to do the hard work to figure out will your customers pay the price that you can afford to give them the product or service at, and you use money to subsidize that. That, for me, is moving fast, but I think in many ways that's reckless. It's reckless because you don't know if you have product market fit. You've actually spoofed product market fit. You've turned it into a commodity, and product market fit is not a commodity. It is not for sale. And so be careful when you see some businesses that have money. My, my general concern as an investor is if you give a company too much money, it solves problems with money, half of which will be good to solve with money, the other half which will be dangerous to solve with money. Good example is Groupon. Yeah, and, and, and well, okay. Groupon, there's a lot of things, a lot of lessons, although they built a good company, but I think in many ways, having as much money as they had was hard. Uh, it made them build the company in a way that I don't think you would have built otherwise. Because I realize I have to come up to ask the question. I probably will hesitate before I make the move. But there, here I am again. Um, it's <laughs> again a question on speed. You said about how important it is to, to race against liquidity to get that. But you didn't quite say how do you do that. We know it's important. But like if I'm Uber today, I'm fighting with, with Lyft. What, am I against luck? There are a lot of things that's outside of my control. So how do you, what's the tip? Don't you take, you know, so take I think effort. this is what we're talking about in the article with Simon. I think our view is that like, what really matters in liquidity, like if you're a marketplace, liquidity is defined by how well do the buyers and the sellers interact. Understood broadly, it's drivers and users or whatever have you on the marketplace. Like you need to f liquidity means like I've re really nailed the mechanism that matches and allows for a transaction to happen between the two sides. That's liquidity. Okay. Which is very different, which is what Simon was saying, is very different than saying I have a large number of buyers that are signed up and a large number of sellers because I don't know, maybe they're interacting, maybe they're not interacting, maybe they're happy, maybe they're not happy with the transactions. Sure, sure. So liquidity means actually maybe I don't have large numbers, but they're interacting in a very nice way, then I can take Simon's money. Mm -hmm. And you know, put it on, light it on fire, and then you know things will yeah. things will happen. Yeah. Well, I'll give you a couple of specific examples. <laughs> don't light it on fire, please. Don't do that. Sorry, um, I meant the other way. Yeah. But uh, um, so here's the thing. So, getting to product market fit is the race. That's the speed. For marketplaces, that's the final liquidity. For other businesses, it has different definition. But let's assume that you mean the same thing. Product market fit. Getting there fast means being creative. For example, if you're a local business. How do you actually, once you get product market fit, how do you actually go to other markets centrally located? Do you need launch teams? Everyone sees a launch team from Uber. Do you need them? Is that really necessary? Can you, because if you need that, you need, you have a lot of friction, financial and operational friction. You gotta land a team there. You gotta land another team. Can you launch 50 at a time? What prevents you from doing that remotely? And asking yourself the tough questions, because I think the winners are going to be not the companies that take the money and then plant 10 people here, 10 people there, and raise a billion. I think that era is gone. That is dead. The real question is, one company is going to copy Uber's model that used money, and they don't have money, and they're going to go to one city at a time. It's going to take them years after they get product market fit. The other company is going to launch 50 cities in a month, because they're going to use software and remote access. And that's what I'm talking about, speed. Um, Fundamentally, read reimagining re how you build things. Don't look how the companies in the last five years did it that had huge balance sheets. Look at how software can do it. How can you leverage the product and your people to grow much, much faster? And I think that's what's going to find winners going forward. Appreciate that, thanks. Right? Fantastic. Thank you okay. very thanks, much guys. to Thank Simon, uh, Andre, and Al for a great talk. Thank, Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thanks. Appreciate it.